In this video, I'm going to cover the integrated rate law. So when we looked at the rate law in the last section, we saw that the rate of a reaction is a function of the concentration. Well, if I apply calculus to the rate law to integrate the rate law, then I create another equation that shows me the relationship between the concentration of A and the time of the reaction. So um, the, regular re uh, the regular rate law is the concentration of A versus the rate, and the integrated rate law is the concentration of A versus the time. So um, when I integrate a zero order rate law and a first order rate law and a second order rate law, then I get different equations because remember that exponent is either a zero, a one, or a two. So when we integrate a first order rate law, the equation that we're given. So we have the rate equals k times a to the 1 as the regular rate law. And the integrated rate law shows that the concentration at any time is equal to negative rate constant times the time plus the natural log of the initial concentration of a. So this is a first order rate law. This is a first order integrated rate law. And so what we've done is the time, we've taken the rate, and the rate has become time. And so now I can use this equation to show how the concentration is changing over time. So if I know how much time has passed, and I know how much A I started with, and I know what the rate constant is, then I know how much A I have left. That's what an integrated rate law allows me to do. And solving the rate law in this form right here is the form of a straight line. Y equals mx plus b. So you can see here that this is y, the y-axis. Um, x is time. So this is x down here, the x-axis. M is negative k, so the slope here is negative k. And b is the y-intercept, which is the natural log of the initial concentration of A. So here is b. b equals this. m equals this. So um, when I integrate a first order rate law and I get this equation, and this equation is a y equals m times x plus b equation, then I can plot that line, I can plot y and x on a coordinate system. And whatever slope that line is, uh, y versus x, that gives me negative k. So I can plot the concentration of A and how much time has passed to calculate graphically to calculate the rate constant. So for a first order reaction, I have to plot the natural log of A and the time. And that gives me a straight line with a negative slope. If we integrate a second order rate law, then we have a rate law equals k times a squared. This is a second order rate law. So integrating a second order rate law gives me an equation that looks like this. So when I integrate a second order rate law, the equation that I get is 1 over the concentration of any time, that's this y, equals k, which is the slope. And this time the slope is positive. It's not negative k. It's positive k. So we see a line that points up. It has a positive slope. Times t, which is x, y equals mx plus b. And b, my y-intercept, is 1 over the initial concentration of a, right here. So a sub t, we call this the concentration of a at some time, at any time. So that just means that it could be any value on this axis. I could go anywhere from the top to the bottom of this axis. The concentration of a at some time. And a 
sub zero, or sometimes it's also A sub I, is the concentration of A initially. Or when T equals zero. When T equals zero, that's the initial concentration. And then the reaction starts. And as the reaction starts, the concentration of A decreases. So then I can calculate the concentration of A at any time after the initial, after the beginning, if I know how much time has passed, and I know what the rate constant is for that reaction. And again, since this is a second order rate law, it has a different shape than a first order rate law, a different equation. So the, the line, the straight line, now points up instead of pointing down. So here is a table that summarizes different rate laws um, as a function of their order. So remember, a zero order rate law is one where the exponent is zero. So in a zero order rate law, a to the zero power is k, so then the rate just equals k, equals k times one. Rate equals k. The units of k, we can solve for the units, and we did this um, in a practice problem. You just put in the units of concentration, which are molar, units of rate, which are molar per second, and determine by a function of what the exponent is, what the units of k must be by dimensional analysis. You cross out those in the numerator and the denominator. So here's a zero order reaction, zero order rate law, units of k, the integrated rate law for a zero order. We didn't look at this one, but when it's zero order, it's not the natural log of a, and it's not one over a. When it's zero order, it's just a. a equals negative k times t plus initial a. So the uh, if I graphically determine a zero order rate law and I plot A versus time, I'm going to get a straight line that has a negative slope similar to if I plot natural log of A versus time and I get a straight line that has a negative slope. But if I plot 1 over A versus time and it's a second order reaction, I'll get a, a, a line like this that has a positive slope, a straight line that has a positive slope. So we'll look at the power of using, of graphing our information to determine the order of a reaction. And once we've done that, we can um, use the equation of a line to solve for k. Or if we have um, these concentration at time t and the concentration at time a, then we can solve for t. We just use algebra and solve this equation for the unknown. Um, and finally, we're going to look at something that's called the half-life. And the half-life is another way of saying that if I start with this much of A at time zero, and I, ha and I have half as much of A at the next time, how much time has passed? And we call that the half-life. That's the amount of time it takes for the concentration of a reactant to be cut in half. So depending on whether we're talking about a zero order reaction or a first order reaction or a second order reaction, the amount of time it takes for a uh, reactant to be cut in half is different. The half-life is different based on order. So when we're trying to determine the uh, order of a reaction and we have some graphical data, then we can look at those graphs and if we see a straight line, in one of these three plots, then we can say that that equation, that that reaction is either zero order or first order or second order. And so the way that this works is, as we just saw in this table up here, this is, a, this is y equals mx plus b. So when it's zero order, y is a and x is t. When it's first order, y is ln of a and x is t. And when it's second order, y is 1 over a, and x equals t. So um, if we, are, we have some data, we have a concentration, and we have time, how the concentration changes over time. So if I plot this information here, and I plot the concentration, this is a, and I plot the concentration of a versus time, if I don't get a straight line from plotting that, this is what this would be zeroth order, right? Zero order. 
and I know it's zero order because it's concentration versus time. So again, let's revisit this. If it's just the concentration, then if y equals just the concentration of a, then that's a zero order reaction. If I'm looking at the y, the y axis on a plot, and it's not the concentration of a, it's the natural log of a, then I'm talking about a first order reaction, not a zero order reaction. And again, if I'm looking at a plot and it's not A or natural log of A, but it's 1 over A, then I'm talking about a second order reaction. So here I've got A versus time. So I know that I'm looking at a zero order reaction. If I plot the data that's given to me and I am expecting a straight line, but I instead get a line that's curved, then what that means is that this is not a zero order reaction. Whatever reaction I'm talking about and I plot this data, if it doesn't give me a straight line when I plot A versus time, then it's not zero order. So, is it first order? First order means that I need to, to plot the natural log of A versus time. So I'll take A and I'll get the natural log and I'll plot the natural log of A versus time. And when I do that and I get, and I plot my data in here and I get this line and it's still not a straight line, then remember this is what I was expecting for first order because first equals natural log versus time. But if I don't get a straight line when I plot this data, then my reaction is not first order. So is it second order? Let's see. I'll plot my data, but now I have to change my data a little bit. How do I change my data this time? I have A, but instead of just plotting A versus time, and instead of taking the natural log of A versus time, the third thing I have to do is take 1 over A versus time and plot that. So when I plot 1 over A versus time, if I get a straight line from that and I plot that data and then it gives me a straight line and this is the plot for a second order reaction, then I know, cha-ching, it's a second order reaction. So this is a lot of work is this what we're trying to do when I graph when I'm graphing concentration versus time the point of doing that is to try to figure out is this a zero order reaction or a first order reaction or a second order reaction and in order to answer that question using this method I have to make three graphs I make this graph is it a straight line no so it's not zero order okay and now I'll make oops I'll make this graph is it a straight line no therefore it's not first order all right finally I'll make this graph is it a straight line yes aha then my reaction is a second order reaction so it's a lot of work you've got to make three graphs in order to determine whether the reaction is zero first or second order The half-life is the amount of time, the length of time it takes for the concentration of a reactant to fall to half of its initial value. The half-life of the reaction depends on the order of the reaction. So, for example, in a first order reaction, the time that it takes for us to go from 1 to 0.5 is the same amount of time that it takes to go from 0.5 to 0.25, I'll lose half again, and it's the same amount of time to go from 0.25 to 0.125. See, the half-life, T1 half, is always constant. So for a first-order reaction, then it doesn't matter how much I start with, the half-life is always going to be the same amount of time. But half-lives are different depending on whether I'm talking about a zero-order reaction, a first-order reaction, or a second-order reaction. So, in general though, I can say about all different orders, the half-life is always the amount of time it takes for the concentration to fall to half its initial value. So let's look back at our table here. Here are, here are the half-life expressions for a zero-order reaction, a first-order reaction, and a second-order reaction. Here, in a zero-order reaction, the half-life is equal to the concentration of A divided by 2 times the rate constant. So in a zero order reaction the amount of time it takes for the concentration to go to 1 half is a function of how much I start with. T1 half is equal to the amount I start with divided by something. So if I change the amount I start with I'm going to change the half-life. Now let's look at the half-life expression for first order reaction. 
half-life is equal to 0.693 over k. So there is, in this expression right here, there is no concentration of A. So in a first order reaction, the half-life does not depend on how much A I have. The half-life only depends on the rate constant. In a zero order reaction, the half-life depends on how much I have and the rate constant. In a second order reaction, the half-life depends on how much I have and the rate constant. But in a first order reaction, it only depends on the rate constant. The concentration of A is not in this expression anywhere. So what we can say is that for a first order reaction, the half-life is constant and it's independent of the concentration. So if I start with 100% and then I have 12.5% left, how many half-lives have gone by? Well, after one half-life, I go from 100% to 50%. After two half-lives, I go from 50% to 25%. After three half-lives, I go from 25 to 12.5%. So it's been three half-lives. How many half-lives would it take for me to get to 6.125%? That would be the next half-life, right? I just take 12.5%. Five, and when I divide that by 2 and I get half, then I would be down here and I'd have 6 point, what was this, 25, 12.5, 6 point 2, 5, right? And this would be the next half-life. And I can figure out how much I would have after the next half-life. I would just take 6.25 and divide that in half. And that's how much I would have after the next half-life. So it's always half as much as I had before. 100 into 50, 50 into 25, 25 into 12 and a half, and so on and so on. At least that's true for a first order reaction. So again, for a zero order reaction, the lower the initial concentration of the reactants, the shorter the half-life. So if I have less stuff, then the half-life um, seems to uh, if I have lower reaction, then the half-life is shorter. If I have lower concentration of reactants, then the half-life is shorter. For a first order reaction, if I have a lower concentration of reactants, the half-life is the same, because it doesn't matter how much reactant I have. And if I have a second order reaction, the half-life is inversely proportional to the initial concentration, which means that if I increase the initial concentration, then the, the half-life actually gets shorter. So the half-life speeds up if I have more stuff. Changing the temperature changes the rate of the 